Hello and welcome back to Rams Rant and today I'm delighted to be joined by Gary Tobbs who is an American journalist and writer. He is the author of books such as Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, The Case Against Sugar, The Case for Keto and most recently his latest book known as Rethinking Diabetes. So thanks a lot Gary for coming on the show and firstly how are you doing today? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. No problem. Interested to to talk. And when I get guests on, talk mostly talking about their, their life's work or specific maybe topics, I always I always like to know like what made them end up in their line of work. And with you you've got an extensive amount of work to your name, but I suppose like was it what was the moment that or person that made you want to get interested in science and ultimately how nutrition and health affected us on a day-to-day life point of view? Well, yeah, since I've been, um, so there were, okay. Uh, I was a physics major in college and I wasn't very good at it. Um, B minus student is not going anywhere in physics. Uh, I read All the President's Men, which is a famous book by uh, uh, you know, uh, Woodward and Bernstein about uh, investigating Richard Nixon and eventually leading to his impeachment. And I decided I wanted to be an investigative journalist. So I went off to journalism school. And when I got out of journalism school, I couldn't get any jobs. Nobody's hiring a 22 year old as an investigative journalist and I wanted to stay in New York City. So I became a science writer. And then I realized over the course of my reporting that just like there are people who do their jobs badly in every profession, there are bad journalists or bad plumbers or bad doctors, uh, bad car mechanics, there are also bad scientists. And I had the opportunity in my first two books to write about first physicists and then chemists who discovered non-existent phenomena. So my first two books were about scientists getting the wrong answer and how they realized they had gotten it wrong. And I became obsessed with how hard it is to do science right. And in the course of writing those two books, I got mentored by some of the best experimental scientists in the world about how to think about evidence and research and what it takes in effect to have reasonable probability of getting the right answer. Um, in the uh, After my second book, some of my friends in the physics community, and that point I had a lot who liked what I did, said, if you're interested in bad science, you should get into public health. That stuff's terrible. And I <laughs> did. Yeah. And in the 90s, I wrote several investigative articles for the journal Science about like the field of nutritional epidemiology, most notably. And then in the late 90s, I stumbled into nutrition where the science happened to be even worse than it was in other areas of public health. And I've never been able to get out. Uh, I'm either the best journalist in the field or a quack, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, which is kind of where society is at at the moment, Gary, uh, if I may say so. But that is that is part of the, the interest I have in your work is that, as, as you alluded to there, people are either, you know, transformed by your ideas and suggestions. Well, then, as to quote yourself, you're titled to a quack in some some areas of planet Earth. But like a lot of your your work it's it's challenging some of the conventional understandings around you know health nutrition diets or even things like carbohydrates but when you initially started out and as you said when you started writing your first few books like was there a huge amount of like obstacles and pushback at that time when you started out early or were you so determined that you didn't really listen to maybe outside noise or other potential experts in the field disagreeing with your ideas? Well, so I started this doing these investigations for science. 
So Science and Nature are the two most prestigious science journals. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's not common for journalists to go after bad science. So we, you know, on occasions, an investigative journalist will do a fraud investigation, but it'll be based on the investigations that the scientific community is doing of its own. Um, they tend not to, I mean, there've been a few of us over the years who have just said, look, you know, it's, we are capable of understanding what it takes to do this stuff right. And we get guidance from other researchers in the field who do it right. And we can make these claims that this whole discipline is doing it wrong. Um, everything I did got pushed back. When I first wrote about epidemiology for science in 1995 in an article that became infamous in the field. Um, you know, the epidemiologists wrote letters saying, I don't understand what they're doing. I clearly got it wrong. Um, the first two investigations I did on nutrition for science were on salt and fat. And, you know, people went after me. Um, they wrote letters to the journal saying I didn't understand the science. And I just, despite the fact that in these articles, I'm quoting their colleagues and their peers siding with me, you know, you can't let it go. So they uh, attack when the first major piece I did um, in in obesity it was a cover story for the New York Times magazine. Um, the front page, the cover was a picture of a greasy porterhouse steak with a pat of butter on it. And the headline was, you know, what if fat doesn't make you fat and inside? I think the story was called what if it's all been a big fat lie. And I accused the suggested that the nutrition research community had made these horrible mistakes for 50 years. And if anyone had gotten closest to the truth, it was Robert Atkins, the extremely controversial author of Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution. And uh, that was the most controversial, may have been the most controversial article the New York Times Magazine ever ran. Um, I mean, I, I had friends, former friends attack me in articles um, accusing me of selling out, accusing me of, in effect, I had a, a friend who was, um, she ran the, probably might still do it, a journalism program at one of the big Boston colleges. I won't name it. And she had considered me one of the three best science journalists in the country until I wrote that story. And then she accused me of having a head transplant in Time Magazine. I think it was her Newsweek, one of these. Um, the Washington Post did a hit piece on me that was so bad that I had to go to the managing editor of the Washington Post to get corrections written. Um, I, it's not that I was particularly courageous. I just didn't realize quite the nature of the, can I use scatological language on your um, podcast? Yeah, feel free. Um, yeah, I just didn't realize quite the nature of the shit I was throwing at the fan. <laughs> and how much it would splash back on me. But, um, and then I, after a while, you just get used to it. It's, you can't accuse people of basically either wasting their entire careers or getting the, the wrong answer for their entire careers without expecting them to take offense. Um, nobody can admit to themselves that they could have screwed up. I mean, one of the criticisms of me is that I can't admit to myself if I screwed up so that I may have made horrible mistakes myself and will never admit it. So, you know, it's just kind of the nature of the business when you go after not just conventional wisdom, but the people who have spent their careers building that conventional wisdom, they're going to take offense. And a lot of these people, I'm, you know, they, they don't do it silently or they ignore you. That's the other thing, which is actually yeah. worse. I prefer them to, take offense because then you can say let's discuss the data let's discuss the evidence if they ignore you you can't have that conversation yeah and it, is that probably the because there's so many different complexities 
say for someone like you who needs to like translate all the scientific research and present it in a way that people like me and just a general audience can understand and maybe you know relate to well obviously it's important to maintain accuracy and even objectivity from your side of it but is that nearly the the hardest part of it where even if someone may be wrong since they are so bedded into you know an idea or research around the science or understanding around that principle is that where like you face your biggest challenges where the most frustrating elements of your research comes about by people just not admitting to the fact that they're wrong in certain cases? Um, well, they can't admit that they're wrong. It's funny. I was just talking to a very uh, respected pediatric nutritionist yesterday and we were on the phone for two hours and he used the phrase I had never heard of before. He called it allegiance bias. And allegiance bias is your allegiance to what you've always believed, the allegiance to what your friends and colleagues and your sort of group and your peers believe. It just, you know, if you think about these people, um, so one of the, I'm writing again today for the Substack I've been doing with Nina Teicholz, I'm writing about um, the nurses' health study at the Harvard School of Public Health and some of the most the highly cited influential nutritionists in the world have built their careers on that one study. And I think it's scientifically bankrupt, but they've not only have they published, say, a thousand papers out of this study, which is probably, you know, a, a, a underestimate. Um, they've, you know, gone from being associate professors to full professors, to head of departments, to head of institutions to, you know, they, they've gotten extraordinary accolades from doing this. And then some journalist comes along and says, oh, by the way, it's complete crap. Uh, what do you do if you're that person? And I mean, in theory, science corrects itself and scientists are supposed to be the people who could admit they make mistakes. One of my, uh, allies out here, and I live in uh, Oakland, right on the border of Berkeley, and uh, one of my allies at the University of California, Berkeley, also one of the most um, prominent nutritionists in the country. She's in her 80s, and I sort of fell in love with her when she said, you know, I'm old enough to admit that I've made mistakes, and why bother doing this <laughs> if I'm not going to do that? But she can do it. Most people can't. They just, especially if their whole careers have been based on, you know, for instance, using one particular type of study to get what I think is a wrong answer, then you just can't do it. So that's one of the major challenges. The other challenge is, you know, this these belief systems in nutrition and health have spread you know, they start with a group of scientists with the hypothesis, a group of researchers with the hypothesis, and then um, the hypotheses are tested. And I wouldn't have written what I wrote if those tests had successfully confirmed the hypotheses, but they didn't. But because the tests take so long and they're so expensive, the researchers decided they're probably true anyway. And then they get disseminated by government agencies and health associations like the American Heart Association or the British Diabetes Foundation. And they become so embedded in our society that it becomes virtually impossible to, to shift them. It's like, um, you know, you can, it's very easy to fill a vacuum, but once that vacuum is filled, then you have to displace what's in there with something else, and that's extremely hard to do. So I was, again, talking to another research friend of mine the other day. We're co-authors on an article that's been in review at the journal Obesity Reviews for going on months now. And I said, you know, even if this gets published, and it's a 8,000-word review of all the evidence from all the animal models of what we believe is true, even if it gets published, it's going to be one of 150 articles that are published on obesity that week. And the other 149 are all going to be based on the conventional thinking in the field. And 
no matter how compelling our argument is, there's also going to be about 10 weeks of papers that have already been written that are being reviewed. That So say another 1,500 papers in the works that are all based on the conventional thinking. And then maybe another 10,000 papers that have been written but not yet submitted yet that are all based on the conventional wisdom. And all that shit is going to come out and sort of bury whatever we say under this deluge of noise. And it just makes it, you know, it's, I mean, shifting conventional wisdom on, on that level is almost impossible. There, there's a flip side, though. So that's the bad news. Can I give you the good news? The good yeah, news is we're advocating for, for dietary approaches. Yeah, the good news is we're arguing for dietary approaches at work that actually make people healthier. And the internet, you know, took away the sort of gatekeepers. So they used to be you had to go buy books that were, you know, all the doctor said was quackery. But now you've got obesity and diabetes epidemics. You've got doctors who are struggling with obesity and diabetes. You've got conventional wisdom that doesn't work. And you've got people like me saying, look, try this, try this keto thing because it does work. And all you have to do is Google successful diets for weight loss. And if you keep trying them until you eventually get to this keto thing, and that works for some large proportion of the people who try it, and then it doesn't matter what the academics think. It doesn't even matter all that much what your doctor thinks, although it helps. And then you could decide for yourself. So people like me making the arguments we do have been making progress because we hold the best cards, basically. We actually know we can give you dietary advice that will change your life and make you healthier, and the establishment position won't, if I'm right. Yeah, and I would say just to quickly focus on your, your book, the, the Case for Keto, you mentioned it there. It's a it's a very popular diet amongst people I know in Dublin, especially if people are into their fitness. At least most people I speak to have at least tried it. But when you maybe could promote it or talk about it, do you like what are the biggest concerns or misconceptions? Like like I know some of the in intricacies to it myself. I've even considered doing it myself for my own like diabetic needs. It seems like it'd be a good fit for my lifestyle, but like a lot of people just casually say, oh, I need carbs for energy and some of this like unsubstantiated nonsense. But like what are some of the biggest concerns and misconceptions you get about the keto diet and like how would you encourage people to somewhat ignore them? Um, I mean, the world is full of misconceptions about them. Um, I mean, it's a strange, again, one of if, so my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, documented the history of all this. And um, there's history in all my books, even the case for keto, I digress into the history. The problem is once people, the, the establishment started getting it wrong, pushing this idea that obesity is just caused by eating too much and exercising too little, and the, you should just you know, cut back on calories and work out to lose weight or cut back on fat calories specifically and instead eat carbohydrates. Um, they were pushing a diet that didn't work, an approach that didn't work. And so they also found out that nobody stayed on diets. So part of the conventional wisdom of this field is that nobody sticks with the diet. So if you were to go to your doctor and say, you know, I'm thinking of trying this keto thing, your doctor is going to say, well, it's just very hard to comply with. So implying that you shouldn't bother. Like if you were to go and say, I'm going to work out an hour and a half a day, the doctor would completely support you, even though that takes an enormous amount of work and effort. But if you're going to say, I'm going to change my diet, um, and then there's this belief, for instance, that there's something magical about the keto diet or ketones. And one reality is the, the ultimately this comes down to the simple idea that carbohydrate, for those of us who get fat easily, the problem is the carbohydrate content of the diet. The link 
to diet goes through carbohydrates and the hormone insulin. And the simplest way to say that is that carbohydrates are fattening. So if I'm telling you to go on a keto diet, I'm basically saying, look, carbohydrates are fattening for you. They're not fattening for your thin friend, which is just like, you know, for you to eat carbohydrates as a type one diabetic, you know, as a diabetic that the macronutrients you're consuming have different effects on you than they have on your friends. And the yeah. assumption here is if you're, you know, overweight or obese, the carbohydrates are the problem for you, even though your thin friend might be able to live on, you know, donuts and beer all day long and stay lean. But for you, you can't. So it's sort of don't eat them. If you don't want to be overweight or obese, you don't eat them. That is keto for all intents and purposes. I mean, you want to eat to satiety. So you got to figure out what else you're going to eat. And ideally, you're getting more fat than protein. And that, you know, there are nuances like that. But for the most part, it's don't, you know, you don't eat sweets, starches, grains, legumes, because stay away from the beer because they make you fat. If you don't want to be fat, you can't eat them if you don't want to. And it's not like you can give them up. And then when you get to a healthy weight, go back to eating them because they will always make you fat because that's the way your body works. So there's all these, you know, these things are, um, I was just looking at a website the other day at a new diet program that you could spend money for and buy an app for. And it's all this bells and whistles tied around the idea that you're not eating, you know, sweets, grains, starches, and maybe not legumes. Um, the uh, major worry, people say, well, it's going to raise your LDL cholesterol, and that's going to give you heart disease. And it's true that it might indeed raise your LDL cholesterol. What is probably untrue is that that will increase your risk of heart disease, because while it raises your cholesterol, it also lowers your triglycerides and raises your HDL and lowers your blood sugar and keeps it more stable. and uh, lowers your blood pressure. There's a whole slew of positive biological effects that, you know, I would bet, I guess I am betting, greatly outweigh the any deleterious effect from LDL cholesterol. But the medical establishment has been so locked into this cholesterol LDL thing for since the 1970s that there's no, you know, your doctor will be programmed to tell you it's going to raise your LDL cholesterol and give you heart disease, and therefore you shouldn't do it. But if you were to do it and come in 50 pounds lighter with all your other numbers having been corrected, your blood sugar's under control, your blood pressure's down, your HDL's up, now your doctor's likely to say, I'm worried about the LDL, but keep doing what you're doing because you're clearly healthier now than you were. So these are the kind of challenges. Yeah. And with, with say, society now, I find, like, whether it's to do with exercise, our diets, our nutrition, our supplementation, it is just a barrage now. Like, it is just no matter where you're looking – what your goals are, what your background is, like my background as a diabetic compared to someone who isn't, is vastly different in how I'm going to be targeted for foods, diets, etc. But do you find we're in a an oversaturated saturated environment now where actual quality information is being given to the people who need it? Or is it a case where you know, people have so much access to information that if they're diligent enough, they'll always find it. Um, yeah, no, I, it, it's, we're definitely overloaded. I mean, it's, you can't turn around without somebody giving you diet advice or exercise advice. And it's, um, I mean, I live in Northern California. So this barrage of plant-based diets, vegetarian diets, vegan diets, or even well, we're supposed to change our diets because of climate change. Um, so you don't have to <laughs> not just worrying about your own health, you're worrying about the climate's health. Um, I've seen it in my own field. So when I first started writing about this stuff 24 years ago, um, 
there were maybe six physicians in America who were advocating for low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets. They'd all written diet books because they wanted to get the message out, not because they thought they were going to get rich. Maybe they thought they were going to get rich because they found they found something that worked and they wanted to yeah. tell other people. And if they could monetize that, that's terrific. Um, today, there's tens of thousands of physicians advocating that people should eat the way I personally think they should eat. Um, but in those tens of thousands, there's now hundreds of books and everybody has to add something to the book. They can't just say, like as a journalist, I could give my story and then I could say, you know, read. I could give Atkins credit and then Eads who wrote Protein Power credit and I could go all the way back to you know, the 19th century and give them credit. But if you're writing your own book, you got to give value added, right? So that's where you start throwing yeah. in the bells and whistles. And if you could throw in the bells and whistles and charge for it online and make it into an app, that's even better. And the fundamental message, which is, hey, dude, carbs are fattening, don't eat them. Excuse me, my wife it drives her crazy when her 67-year-old husband uses the word dude, um, especially in 2024. So um, anyway, that's <laughs> You're all right. That's the, the simplistic thing. And then you have exercise physiologists and, uh, you know, the healthiest people tend to be the people who, you know, the world is full of like 25-year-old crossfitters or marathon runners who think that if they everybody else did what they did, they'd be as fit as they are. And so they promote marathon running or crossfit or rocking or pick your, you know, exercise because they think that's the key. And then they'll also tell you, oh, by the way, don't eat, you know, refined carbs and sugars and don't drink a lot of beer because that'll confound the effect but so even the vegetarian the plant-based people will tell you look it's all about the meat and the processed meat and that's what kills you but you've got to eat a healthy vegetarian diet and a healthy vegetarian diet is a diet without sugar or white flour or you know french fries or beer so you're still getting rid of sort of the things that are fattening but now you're saying meat is the problem and we're going to get rid of that too and that's why on some level every one of my books despite being sort of combinations of history and and you know ending up with sort of clear guidance for what i believe end up also saying look we just need research studies that could weed all the crap out and tell you what's really believable and what's not yeah no true and with regards to your latest work, the Rethinking Diabetes uh, book, it uh, was first and foremost, a, it was a very interesting read, very informative, and that's coming from a, a guy who's had to live with it day in, day out as type one. Uh, you size what I like about it, especially is like there's a good amount of references. You also add in your own opinions on some of the studies and finds or references that you, you size, but when you talk about, there's a chapter focusing on the low blood sugar, you talk about the role and nearly the history of insulin loose, uh, usage and glucogen as well, and how there's more than really that meets the eye when talking about the actual causes of high uh, or blo low bl blood sugar, I should say. And in your eyes, like how do you find the relationship of both those things, insulin and glucogen, and how are they, in some cases, in your perspective, good, but then also evil, if that makes sense? Or that could be too strong of a term. I don't know. Well, let me ask you a question. Can I ask you a question, since I'm also a journalist? I mean, what was your, like, when you were diagnosed, what were you told about the causes of low blood sugar? And were you, uh, did they have you experience a hypoglycemic episode in the in the hospital so you would recognize it when it happens? No, it was, I, I went in exceptionally high in ketosis and yeah, the first hypo I had, low blood sugar was a couple of, I think it was like four days after I was discharged from hospital. But the, the advice I got was, this is your insulin 
take for every 10 grams of carbs, take one unit and inject and go on and go on. And after about six months, I realized I was probably about 1.5 units for every 10 grams of carbs because my tolerance seemed to be a lot higher than the average person. And yeah, the whole thing was be careful when you exercise because your blood could go low, even though sometimes it would have the opposite effect. So it was it was quite vague and it was very much a, a trial and error on my behalf where what they told me didn't necessarily work for me. And like with most people, I had to listen to my body and react to it pretty quickly because as you well know, with diabetes, you can't really mess around or wait till it messes you up. So yeah, I found that really insulin was the main cause of all my solutions and also all my problems. Well, this is, um, and did they suggest to you that you didn't have to eat the 10 grams of carbs and that that would be one way to solve the problem? Yeah. Well, that was one of the first questions I asked. I go, so if I just eat steaks and chicken and eggs for the rest of my life, will I ever have to inject? And they said, well, you'll have to have some sort of a background dose and how your body would work depending on exercise, anxiety, nervousness, whatever it can fluctuate on a whim. So they told me that although you'd have to inject a lot less, you'd still have to inject. So I kind of thought I'd either be all in where I just eat protein and don't have to inject or I would, you know, eat somewhat of a normal balanced diet and inject when needed. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's funny, after doing, I did a radio show um, here in the States about a month ago. And afterwards, um, I got an email like a week later from a woman who said, oh, I heard you on the radio and I have type 1 diabetes and I'm going to go off my insulin and and see if <laughs> how I do. And I was like, I mean, I never answered an email so fast in my life. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> It's like, if you've got type one diabetes, that's, you know, it's like find a physician. You could definitely handle it better than you're handling it, but you're always going to need insulin. Um, the, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, there are a lot of revelations. One of the reasons the book is long and dense is because I was so stunned by all the, th- I've been, yeah, I'm okay. I don't have diabetes myself. I'm not a physician. I'm, I'm not a diabetes specialist. It was a dangerous book for me to write as a journalist where I felt much more confident with all my other books. Um, hmm. I, uh, yeah, but I'd been working in this field now for 20 years and I was just stunned by when you actually look at the history what you learn like the the role of glucagon and the fact that when you have high blood sugar as a patient with type 1 diabetes it's not necessarily because of the carbs that you're eating but the failure of your liver to shut off you know uh, what's called de novo glucogenesis production of glucose and secreting that glucose into the liver and the revelation that, that, you know, that's the job that's like glucagon is, is stimulating that and insulin is inhibiting this hormone glucagon. And if you don't have the insulin, you can't inhibit the glucagon. So your liver just keeps dumping glucose into the bloodstream and responds to the glucagon when it's supposed to stop if you eat carbohydrates and which will stimulate insulin secretion. So you've got this incredibly complex, what's called a homeostatic system, and it's dependent on insulin. And then every hormone has what's called a counter regulatory hormone. So you've got a hormone and you're going to, there's going to be a hormone that does the opposite and they're going to stimulate and inhibit each other. And for one thing, one hormone, because you never want the system to get into a position where it's spinning out of control, where, you know, it's got a positive feedback, where, uh, where we're afraid of with climate change, where things will just keep getting worse because yeah. one change will create a second change, which will be worse, which will create. So everything's got these negative feedback loops to prevent, keep the system sort of buffered and under control. And if you don't have insulin, um, you don't have insulin inhibiting glucagon, which is its counter regulator and hormone. You don't have glucagon coming up in cycles. And it's just um, all of this was worked out as soon as you can measure glucagon in the circulation and insulin was like the 1960s. 
but it had precious little effect on how anybody treated the disorder. If what people were learning about glucagon was right, you could never really prevent yourself from having hypoglycemic reactions when you're injecting insulin. I think insulin pumps will make it better, but you're always going to have hypoglycemia. And the way to prevent it is to minimize yeah. the insulin use. And this is what Bernstein wrote about in his Diabetes Solution book. And Bernstein was the very first patient, the very first patient in the world to ever measure his blood sugar regularly to see how it responded, not just you know to the foods he ate, to the exercise he did, to stress and anxiety and all that. Now you could have a CGM that could tell you, you know, constantly what's happening. But back then, they didn't know. So you've got all these sort of revelations about what's happening physiologically in diabetes, how your body is responding, that insulin secreted by the pancreas has entirely sort of different effects than insulin injected, you know, that enters your circulation elsewhere. Um, because the different I thought this was really cool. Like when insulin secreted from these beta cells and stop me if I'm getting too technical for your audience, but so you got on your pancreas, no you got these beta cells that secrete insulin. Yeah. And next to the beta cells, you got these alpha cells that secrete glucagon. So when you secrete insulin, the highest doses are seen at the alpha cells. So that's the the biggest biggest effect they have is on the alpha cells on the secretion of glucagon, and then the insulin goes through its portal vein and it gets to the liver, and the next biggest doses are seen at the liver, and half of the insulin never makes it out of the liver because what it does in the liver, which is absolutely crucial to being healthy, um, that's where the second highest doses are. Then it gets into the general circulation and all the other cells see much lower doses of insulin. If you're injecting it, the highest doses are in the, are in the um, circulation. And in order to have the same effect at the liver that insulin secreted from, I mean, at the pancreas and the liver, that insulin secreted from the pancreas, you've got to give higher doses of insulin because it's starting out in the circulation. It's just it's like this complex biological system where depending on where the hormone is begins its life that that tells you which cells and tissues see the highest doses and have the highest response and then it gets less and less as it gets further and further away and you know people knew this in the 1960s and 1970s and the message was I think the less insulin you use, the healthier you'll be. And the only way you could minimize your insulin use, like as a patient with type one diabetes, you can't, you need insulin. You need it unless maybe you could get by if you ate a 95% fat diet, like this guy Petron gave his patients in Sweden in the 1920s. But you know, I buy it that nobody wants to go that far living yeah. on it was described by a German clinician as uh, butter on cucumbers. <laughs> um, the he said he couldn't imagine anyone but Swedes yeah. eating something like that. <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, the uh, you know if, if you have any protein in your diet, you're going to need insulin. And but the idea is the less insulin you get, the less variations in the insulin, the less swings there are, the less variation is in how your body responds to the insulin. Uh, this is Bernstein's law of small numbers, and it makes perfect sense to anyone who's trained in engineering or systems design. And the way to minimize insulin is to minimize carb consumption. So you end up at sort of an Atkins or keto diet, um, although Bernstein was never really a fan of keto, um, still isn't but he's still alive at 90 and still practicing. He'll, it's going to turn 90 in May, I think, and he's still practicing medicine. Like, uh, Jesus, 82 years after, no, must be like 78 years after being diagnosed, which suggests he's doing something right. Yeah, the law of averages would suggest that he is certainly doing something right there. And, and one of the things you mentioned, yeah, around diet and one thing i find fascinating with diabetics and some of my i 
there's a few of my close friends who are type one diabetics and I've met people who are type two as well. The, in the book, thinking, we think in diabetes, you, you spend an entire chapter going through the role of fat in people's diets, how it affects people with diabetes. And like over a hundred years ago, people were having fat only diets and thought it could be the way forward, but it proved not to be the total solution as you've just previously mentioned. But one thing I noticed with fat, and I, I've gone to so many different doctors who have said, maybe try this, don't do that, do this, X and Y, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing I've always found is that fat, and you might be able to maybe give it on a higher level here, but whether I'm having the filthiest fat meal, so say a big pizza, which is high fat, high carbs, or else I'm maybe just having high fat kind of protein based food. I always find that my blood it's it's the hardest it will ever be that four to six hour period after I eat high fat meals, whether it's high carbs or high protein, because it just seems that releasing any carbs or any sugar or anything in my body, it takes several hours to break down. And then when it comes, it just comes in floods. And I was just wondering, like, what's your take on the role of fat? Like, does it have to purely be based with protein? Or can it be mixed with carbohydrates as well? And if so, like what role is fat going to have in that? Well, it's interesting because what you're suggesting is for you, mixing it with carbs is a bad solution. Is no solution. But what would be interesting to see is what happens if you adapt to a very low carb, high fat diet. Um, which takes time. Mm. And in, in the case of a patient like the, somebody with type 1 diabetes, you're going to have to lower your insulin pretty much immediately. So, you know, it's it's going to be another learning experience in how to deal with this. Um, although there are plenty of guides on the internet and Facebook groups for people who eat ketogenic diets and have type 1 diabetes and Facebook groups, particularly this group Type 1 Grit for people who follow Bernstein's uh, program, which is lower in fat, still very high compared to what you're probably eating now. Um, the point is you don't need fat. You don't need insulin to metabolize fat. So that makes it on one level the safest of all macronutrients for somebody with that. But the problem is as soon as you add carbohydrates into the diet, you do need the insulin and your body is responding to the fat in and now in a different environment. Um, and again, I can't even begin to guess why your blood sugar would be particularly worse with a fatty meal like pizza than it would be if you just ate I don't know, boiled potatoes or something that you guys seem to like in Ireland and I can never <laughs> understand. Um, yeah, we do. The, uh, yeah. But, um, you know, the main point in this is one way to think about this as I've come to think about it is you have sort of two levers for controlling your blood sugar. As a, you've got diet and you've got drugs. And the, one of the arguments in this book, Rethinking Diabetes, is as soon as insulin was, until insulin was discovered, they only had diet. That was the only thing that worked. And they, they yeah. physicians, diabetes specialists, this was, diabetes was a rare disease, but diabetes specialists knew that you could keep this disease under control and affect, manifest no symptoms on a, what they called the animal diet in the 19th century, but it was basically fatty meat and fish and you know, green vegetables. And this was a standard of care in the US and the UK and Europe. Um, once insulin is discovered, now you've got a very powerful drug that saves the lives of, you know, people like you, Richie, with type one diabetes um, was completely unnecessary for type two diabetes because that can be controlled by diet. But the, again, at that point in time, it's they, what the physicians were seeing. They had trouble distinguishing what was type two and what is type one. And um, so they ends up giving insulin to everyone. Um, and 
once you start taking insulin, not only do you need carbs in your diet to prevent hypoglycemia, what back then they called insulin shock or insulin overdose, um, it's just a lot easier for the patient and the physician to just say, just look, eat whatever you want, eat what your mother's cooking. You, you know, you, some, how old were you when you were diagnosed? Can I ask? I was 21. So eight years ago. Oh, okay. You were already, you know, but imagine if you're 12, you're di given the same diagnosis. And then as long as well as being told that you have this disease that, you know, back then was like a death sentence. And now mm. we're going to tell you, you can't eat ice cream ever again. And you can't eat pasta ever again. And like potatoes are off the table and it's, you know, <laughs> um, so they weren't going to do that to kids. They just weren't going to say it was like, let them eat what they want and give them insulin to cover it. And again, the other argument I'm making in this book based on these 50 years now of clinical trials is that the drug therapy doesn't make you healthy. It just slows the progression of the disease and the, you know, that it, it slows the appearance of the complications and you will do much better today than you would have done if you were diagnosed 10 years ago or 30 years, well, you were diagnosed 10 years ago, but whatever, you know, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, I mean, no, I got diagnosis you. is much better, but it doesn't make you healthy. And if you have type two diabetes and you don't eat the carbs, basically you'll, for all intents and purposes, stay healthy. You won't need any of the drug therapy. And drug therapies come with complications and side effects. And um, as a type one diabetic, I would assume that you would be much healthier. Like we said, you never know what to do with anecdotal evidence, but the fact that Bernstein's still alive at almost 90 and still practicing medicine suggests there's something, you know, that this, and he went the first, roughly, I don't know, almost 30 years of his diagnosed, no, 25 years before he realized that if he could keep his insulin doses low and his carbs very low, and by doing so have stable blood sugar, like normal, healthy blood sugar. So, you know, it's kind of, if you were diagnosed, when you were diagnosed and your doctor said to you, you know, Richie here, you, we got two choices. We could let you eat pretty much whatever you want, and we could give you insulin to control the blood sugar, and then as your blood pressure starts going up, we'll give you medications for your blood sugar, and we'll put you on statins for heart disease, and if you start having kidney issues, we've got dialysis. And, you know, if you start going blind, this is one of the stories I tell in the book, the doctor who <laughs> you know, starts getting these retinopathies and they treat him with these injections in his eyes. Yeah, and he said, wait, 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 <laughs> before we do the, the needle and the eye thing, let me, let me try something else. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, or they say, look, just don't eat carbs, minimize your yeah. insulin dose and you'll probably be fine. You know, and then you might say, well, I'm going to miss the ice cream and the pasta, but could be worth it you know and what i'm advocating for at the end of the book is let's just you don't have to phrase it the way i just did which is a pretty you know i'm biasing it towards the what i think is the right choice but i don't have this disease um but clearly doctors have to understand this trade-off better these are diseases that can be apparently controlled much better with strict diet and then the question is, which strict diet? And there's some debate about that. And that can be decided, can be studied by clinical trials. But we, our medical system is so, it, you know, it's just easier for doctors to prescribe drugs. It doesn't take as much time. You say, you know, inject this, swallow that. Um, it's great for the drug companies. Um, the medical associations get a lot of support from the drug companies, so it doesn't hurt them to be on the side of drug therapy. And, you know, this, there's no disease out there that's more linked to diet than diabetes. So fix the diet and you will change the outcomes dramatically. And, it's, and that's a story that 
weirdly enough, is only told in a few in diet books. You got to buy a diet book to hear that, and then you don't trust them because, well, the guy who wrote it is a diet book doctor. So. Yeah, back to back to square one at the start of the podcast about people digging in their heels. But yeah, Gary, I'm I'm aware exactly. of of our of our time, and so how I usually just finish the podcast is just with a handful of really quick fire questions, and then I can let you go enjoy the rest of your day as uh, night sets here in Dublin. So yeah, first thing that comes to your mind, just say it, and yeah, they're not too incriminating anyway before you get somewhat nervous but firstly is what's your favorite film of all time uh casablanca second would Classic. be guardians of the uh, galaxy one one okay but first has to be casablanca there's a big difference yeah big difference between those two but uh, yeah I, I like the the diversity the Next question. Well, by the is, time I saw Guardians is, of the Galaxy, I, now let me just say, by the time I saw Guardians of the Galaxy, I'd seen Casablanca like 30, 40 times. So it's hard for me to watch it now. But the fact that I saw it 30 or 40 times in my youth, like I got to give it first. Anyway, okay, yeah, go ahead. No, I got you. What, what is your favorite book of all time? Oh, <clears throat> well, here I, probably The Phantom Tollbooth, which is a uh, kid's book that was written in 1961 or so. Okay. What is your go-to breakfast order? Uh, I don't eat breakfast anymore, but when I did, it was scrambled eggs and bacon. And by the way, when you're asking these questions, I keep waiting for you to say, and what is your favorite color? And I say, <laughs> like, red, no, blue. Because <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail was high in the list of movies I've seen. I almost yeah. know by heart, so. It's popular here in Ireland, Monty Python, very much so. It's a rite of passage for most Irish teenagers or kids be. to watch that. <laughs> yeah. And... What does help is to have the mind worst altering in... substances. Oh, <laughs> yeah. True. No, go ahead. True that. The next one is what is the worst in your opinion? Cleaning the dishes, hoovering the house, or changing the bed sheets. Wait, cleaning the dishes. What were the three choices? So cleaning the dishes, hoovering the house. Are changing the bed sheets. Oh, geez, probably hoovering. I is what we would call vacuum cleaning, vacuuming, right? Yeah, vacuum. Yeah, and yeah, that's just because it's gonna take it's gonna take all that much longer. It's a big house too, in this case. Okay, fair enough. Most people pick the sheets, but I think that's more of a a European issue than a. Uh, a United States issue, I'd say. And well, I also last... have, I have. Yeah, it's a good point because I have I have two teenagers, teen teenage sons, and I don't want to get near their sheets. So <laughs> that, that should have been my first choice. I was thinking yeah, my own this... sheets, which I is relatively quick. <laughs> and last question for you, Gary: If you could, what? Well, Potentially you could be in the process of this, but if you could write another book on a topic, what would it be? Uh, well, I am going to write one more book on the history of obesity science. So that's in the works. But uh, I, all my books on some level have been about good science and bad science. Um, you know, what it takes to establish reliable knowledge. So that's the book I want to write just on that, but because it has no nutrition um, angle and so no self-help angle, my publishers have been unwilling to pay me enough to do it. So I keep, you know, it takes me several years at least to do a book worth reading. And uh, so it keeps getting postponed until 
you know, I win the lottery and can afford to actually write that book. Okay. Well, fingers crossed for you. And yeah, just want to thank you for taking time out to, you know, delve into some of your work and talk a bit about uh, diabetes and other concepts as well, or illnesses in my case. With regards to people who are interested in your work, I'll attach your website and some of your social media sites as well. So if anyone's interested in your books, because you've written a huge amount um, across all different types of you know, diets, health, and as you've kind of mentioned in the podcast as well, many different aspects that cover, you know, a lot of day-to-day issues people will face. So I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for, you know, your latest book, especially it's been quite close to my heart and I found it very beneficial and some of the ideas have been, you know, hopefully revolutionary for the next 30, 40 years of myself and other diabetics around. So keep doing what you're doing. I uh, wish you all the best in the future. Well, and let me, again, uh, thanks a million for Richie. coming on. Thanks. Let me, if you decide to change your diet at all and experiment with this, will you let me know what happens for good or bad? Yeah. I mean, no, it's, I'm at a point. You, in which case it's. <laughs> yeah. Then you'd be, you could be hearing Sorry, from my parents. Say that. It's friends. like a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I'll, I'll let you know they, if I yeah, go down. If you're the... thinking about it, let me know. Yeah. I'll let you know how I get on for sure. Okay. Terrific. Oh, one last thing. I the Substack, can you mention that as well? It's called Unsettled Science. It's a Substack newsletter. Um Yeah, I'll attach I'll attach that, that link and generate the income I need so I could Okay, terrific. Okay, thanks a lot. This was fun. I enjoyed it. So Thanks, Gary. Listen all the best. <laughs> Go to Okay. Take care. Bye bye.